building up. got Lenny Bogdanoff from Milk Video back. Welcome back, Lenny. Woohoo! <laughs> we had such a good conversation last time. Also, I'm sorry if you went over this, but where are you with all these Home Depot boxes? <laughs> uh, so I just moved. Um, my wife and I, and we're in New York, but uh, we unpacked our apartment. But nice. actually, I have like over a thousand books and there's nowhere for them to go. Oh, oh my gosh, wow. that's awesome. <laughs> so they're just going to be in boxes probably for a while. So. Oh, I love that. Yeah, whenever you get like distracted during the day, just walk over to one of the boxes and just see what's inside. <laughs> so um, fun. Where, uh, Mish- Mishti, where are you? I'm in Hawaii right now. It's a very oh, beautiful background over here. Oh, wow, that's the real background. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I'm a big island, which is DK's favorite. Finally, yeah. made it here. <laughs> I'm a Kauai person. That's where we went oh, to our is. honeymoon. Yeah, we made it there. Are you North Shore or me? I know uh, Len- Lenny uh, oh, for yeah. Kauai, oh. kind of like Princeville. Yeah, yeah, I get that's that's that area. in Princeville. Um, I went there maybe twice as a kid. Also, I think mm-hmm. our family had a uh, timeshare. Oh, wow. are, are those even a thing anymore? <laughs> timeshares like yeah, yeah, it does seem like a little bit of a blast from the past. Yeah, <laughs> I think they're getting reinvented. Actually, like. I, I know at least Divi Homes may have been one of the ones, but I think they're kind of reinventing the concept of a timeshare. There's also there's also a bunch of like kind of subscription type services that partial ownership. serve some of the same. Yeah, some of the partial ownership and some of them you own equity in the real estate and some of them you don't. Um, no toast. I, yeah. I, I remember all the uh, timeshare places like you get a free toaster if you come. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. Like, <laughs> they're like, didn't they have like, I think they're famous for having like very hard pressure sales tactics. Big big group. Everyone gets a toaster. Yeah. I think they like, they try to like get, get everybody. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Is my, uh. We can hear you, but we can't see. device running camera. Uh-oh. <laughs> yeah, we see a little like cord image. Oh boy. Okay. Okay. Let's see. Let's just go. Is it your phone connected? We'll go this way. Yeah. Oh, nice. We'll go this way. This is a little bit lower res, and you don't have the kind of cool. Um, I can't see the uh, texture of your hair anymore. Okay, <laughs> like, yeah. Your haircut you, is not. Uh... You could see this this uh, interesting. <laughs> what is <laughs> that? <laughs> is there is somebody burning there? someone else's hand? They're building Stonehenge. Oh, <laughs> are those aliens? Yeah, they're faceless figures. I'm not sure if they're from this planet or another one. <laughs> I thought they proved... Okay, anyway. Very, a couple uh, of interesting pieces of art around this. I know, that's kind um, of a creepy piece of art to have. So this is creepy. There's my, my one piece of art sideways can. Oh, yeah. <laughs> How did you acquire that one? Or did you make it? I made it. It's um. So there's, oh, nice. there's a painting called The Ninth Wave. And... I took the ninth wave bo- picture. It's like a 16th century, you know, some Russian guy. Um, and then, or maybe it's not even called the ninth wave, but uh, I blurred it and then parsed it through like a image kind of processing algorithm mm-hmm. and then oh, wow. painted the results. <laughs> so it's kind of a, <laughs> an interesting thing. Oh yeah. You the painted ninth. the results. You were, you were using a brush and oil or what? What's yeah, the... it's, I mean, it's it's acrylic paint. So acrylic. if you look at the ninth wave, you can see that it's somehow like a silhouette of the ninth wave, but definitely not. I see. <laughs> right. But yeah. the concept, so even Iva Zavsky is the artist, yeah. I think. Yeah. It's a cool, the, the, the concept of this, this uh, the painting is really symbolic of uh, every everything has fallen apart and then you've, you've broken past the uh, hmm. last wave. I think waves come right. in sets. So, yeah. The, uh, the la- when you're in a boat and your boat has tipped over, you start counting the waves before <laughs> you get back on the boat or something. Uh-huh. Did you ever it make a the- night wave inspired street art? I didn't. Th- this was the closest I got. Painting <laughs> <so. laughs> boats around cities, probably. Actually, yeah. that'd be a great tag. A little, uh, little Victorian uh, something. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I would I would love to um I, f- I forget what the context was of scheduling this um 
this specific chat. Yeah, I yeah. think I was looking back at our DMs. I think you were telling us that you were playing around with the video videographer marketplace type concept and could riff a little bit on that. Yeah, I think I was very... Un- yeah, I, and I can, just like general things you're up to with milk. I can confidently say I overestimated how much I'm going to do. <laughs> <laughs> Three months. Uh, it's, 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 yeah, maybe this is a this is a story of any anyone building anything. So we we hired two people full time, which is very exciting. Um, I was in South Africa last month. We uh, hired one person who we were contracting with. I went to go meet him in person, oh, and wow. then we, we uh, hired another person who um, came from Salesforce, who's a principal engineer before lives in Bakersfield, near Bakersfield. So hmm. did did a little bit of uh, face to face meetings with uh, the new new people last last month. And um, you mean actually in person? In person, so you I went, I went out to, to Bakersfield. Went to uh, Kernville is where he lives. Um, so really, really cool uh, kind of desert esque community. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, it's been interesting. We we got a new investor, uh, Eric uh, Yuan from Zoom. Is oh, cool! Our largest oh, investor, which is also oh, amazing, super exciting. We uh, wow. I forget if we talked after or before we fundraised, but we um, we raised uh, just around one point five on. Uh, Re- reasonable terms, which was, oh, awesome. which was great. But um, it's and been, he was the lead for that. He actually, we never even spoke. Uh, oh, okay. He just <laughs> happened to invest the largest amount <laughs> all through two emails. <laughs> He's oh, like, wow. really interesting. He invests through trusts on behalf of his kids. So mm-hmm. he had three kids and his brother, so, and then yeah. his wife and him, um, which which was interesting. But. Um, yeah, it, it it's there's there's so much um to do and so many things that were unstable. So I think we're like kind of stable now as a product, but we we were hoping to do many, many more things and we're just like <laughs> barely barely scraping it together. Um but it's been very interesting. Just like to the first six months of a company. As, as the product being launched and mm-hmm. the number of things that we've been uh, kind of challenging. Our revenue's grown like 100% month over month, which has been pretty nice. good. It's still, still pretty yeah. small, under 10K. But, um, you know, uh, Ross, my co-founder, is uh, hustling away. We got a couple of big clients like VMware and some mm-hmm. other like uh, weird companies you'd never heard of but are huge. Um yeah. Which is which has been fun, but the um, ironically, the, there's somebody emailed me today saying, "Why don't you guys have a video editing agency?" <laughs> I thought it was very <laughs> timely. <laughs> he literally emailed me, "Why isn't there a milk agency?" <laughs> it seems like mm-hmm. it's a good idea. <laughs> um, but well, um, yeah, I, I don't know if I caught all of the the catch up on that idea because it sounded like I think from our DMs you were doing some stuff there, and it sounds like what you're saying now is that that didn't hit your the optimism that you had, but is it that you figured out that you do like that or you don't like that or it just didn't grow as fast as you hoped or kind of what what's yeah, yeah. the state of the union there? So so it's so um, I think when I had messaged we were changing our pricing. So we what's been interesting is. We had we peaked at the number of new customers probably in February, like uh, new new customers in a month. I think we had like I don't know twenty new customers or something sign up. But the revenue that we got from that period has been was the lowest because we just kept increasing the price of the product. So the latest is we now have like a product that's a thousand dollars a month that we work with a company and then manually edit the videos for them through mm-hmm. our tool. So they're paying us essentially to use the tool, which is really interesting. Um, you know, some some companies, they just need the end product and cost is not a big issue. And then um, everyone else, they pay about 350 bucks a month for the same product that we were charging 10 bucks a month for. And we just have a different kind of customer. So uh-huh. it's, it's interesting because the idea of having um, a higher priced product that is still the same product but like a person does the editing for them was really uh, something that we realized we can do. And it, it, I think that's what I was talking about when, when we were chatting. 
So, um, yeah, it's it, it's interesting. Like, I don't think it's a sustainable kind of approach. At least, it's not a marketplace um, for 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 what we're trying to do. But for a certain, there's like a ceiling to how much we can manually facilitate uh, editing other people's work. But um, tell me more about that. I'm I'm curious because this this is a an area that I feel like I see so many different you know marketplace approaches, and they each have their own like nuance or characteristics to how the various players come together and how value is created. So I'm actually curious, you know, to get as deep as possible on these ideas because they're, you know, I think they're just generally interesting to anybody who wants to think about or learn about marketplaces. Yeah. So I, I think, I mean, so the, the, there's like, you can be an opaque marketplace like Uber, or you can be transparent marketplace like Odesk or something. And I think in our case, um, we're m more on the opaque side. So somebody has something they want and then we work with them. So we're facilitating the talent uh, mm -hmm. whether it's through employees or contractors and then mm -hmm. um, making sure that the cost for providing the service, uh, you know, is uh, smaller than the, the, the paid uh, result. On our end, our goal is to phase out. So it's, we're not necessarily building a marketplace. We're more, I, I think I had mentioned last time that we actually started out with the idea that we're going to build a marketplace. Um, kind of like uh, there's these services that will write a blog post for you, you know, at a monthly subscription, or you can get like, um, I don't know, like an EA or something at a monthly subscription in ours. Mm -hmm. We were playing with that idea for just translating video into podcasts and, and, and originally had been just working with contractors in different countries. So that was the process and it was opaque um, to the customer. Mm -hmm. But now it's more, we are just facilitating contract relationship. And then um, for, we're assigning almost like an agency model more than a marketplace. We're assigning contractors to specific customers. So mm -hmm. a customer comes in, we have a sense of what they want. We warm the relationship. And then once the work starts getting defined, then the contractor is the one actually doing the response uh, kind of work workload. If if we wanted to scale out the customer acquisition part, then um, maybe we would scale out the contractor kind of acquisition side too. But it's mm -hmm. the, the bottleneck is having people. It's easier to find contractors. It's harder to find paying customers. So um the interesting thing is we do think there's other companies that will keep paying at this rate. So we'll probably just have on staff contractors as opposed mm -hmm. to total like, you know, uh, higher gun for hire type people on demand. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah. But how, how do you think about the sort of packaging to a customer? Like what, you know, because are you explaining the fact that you're going to, set up a relationship with a contractor and they're going to use your tool or do you just say you're going to write a spec and we're going to give you the video content back or what what is sort of that yeah that packaging look like when when i say it's opaque i mean for them there's no contractor or they, they don't have a notion for the contractor um yep. it, they're just getting the service at the end um it, it, the thing that's tricky i think with any kind of creative product or whenever there's something that's like transform the inputs are in and the outputs haven't yet been defined because it hasn't been done before the um deliverable can look so different so it's it's really like finding out what their need is what the values are um most of these people the uh kind of friction of just figuring out how to make the video and find the people like i think what your uh, experience was that's the part they just don't have time for because it's, it's mm -hmm. too low value but um some people like the turnaround, immediate turnaround is the most important thing. And yeah. um, other people like the design aesthetic, like the planning around that before is the most important thing, like fitting a certain specific governance. So I, I, I do think if we were, so the, the, the big question, and this is the thing I think we disagree on, or I just haven't seen, seen proven out, but if, if we were to build out a marketplace, literally, where someone was just facilitating video editing work, I, I don't know how big that could be without somebody bigger just creating the same marketplace and then sucking up all the attention, like an Adobe or something, create, turning Behance into a, a you know, hiring marketplace or Odesk creating like a categorized, you know, very specific marketplace or something. But hmm. the, um, we, we had a very interesting process in 
March, April, May. In Mar- April, a big video company reached out to us, kind of interest in ac- acquisition, that, that kind of stuff. And they showed us some of the products that they were working on. And es- I think essentially most of these big companies working with enterprise companies are, are really supplementing their product with people to kind of get set up like right. generally that, 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 that is, I think across the board, the experience. So I think what we're doing will probably continue. It won't go full marketplace. It'll just always be like a, we're just paying for the labor by providing right. like a very bespoke uh, kind of enterprise service. So I, I think yeah. that's where we're leaning but the, ideally, w- what we want to do is keep reducing our price such that we're actually fulfilling the price kind of uh, revenue um, through just scale as opposed to these like, uh, you know, having 100 bespoke customers rather have 100,000, you know, cheaper but consistent smaller customers. So Right. And when, when you say, just to make sure we're definitely talking the same thing, when you say marketplace, are you talking about a marketplace like this, there's this opaque or transparent version, I, either of those you're calling kind of marketplace, right? Yeah. Or... Like, like I, I think, I think um, marketplace in the transparent way is like you can pick, you, you have some inventory that you can pick from or you're, you, as the marketplace, as the platform, you're the lister of inventory, uh, you know, the place where people are discovering um, mm-hmm. what, what they're there to purchase. And then pro- Possibly, you also facilitate the relationship um, to the extent that there's some value capture on, on either right. side. So, I think on uh, the opaque side, it's more like Uber. I would still think of Uber as like a, a driver marketplace, but mm-hmm. you're expected to get a baseline service, and the market is bumping off people who don't provide, or they're facilitating right. quality at some level. And um, on our end, we're not really a marketplace at all. We're just like facilitating a product and kind of taking contractors. I, I think at an early stage, yeah. something that's just normal for anything. So, um, yeah. So yeah, I, I don't know that, I don't know that I see a strong disagreement. Is there a certain point where, oh, oh, so what we had talked about, you were, you were mentioning that a marketplace opportunity is more defensible because the idea of building the, uh, kind of brand, and community of uh, people who are high quality post production type people. Th- 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 this is a context uh, f- from, from. Oh, the okay. Um, this from when, when did we chat about this? Like three, six months ago? Yeah, this is a oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. So I, I, I still, I, I've seen a couple um, video editing marketplaces just come by. You know, I think I've sent you one, but um, I, I don't think of them as like being huge businesses. Whereas I think the software approach, um, mm-hmm. you know, is is the thing that is um, has, has huge potential, especially as uh, video becomes more and more um, an asset that you know people want to do something yeah. with. Um, so that, yeah. that 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 was the disagreement point. I, I think the marketplace itself is a good idea, necessary, and the needs is there. But I, right. just, I think opportunity wise, um, it'll be a uh, sure. Yeah. And I. Like just just to clarify at least where it sat in my mind, I don't know the words I may have used. I'm sure we have the video to review, but <laughs> but um, in my mind, the main thing that I was thinking about not is getting the listing content from suppliers and demand, but it's more like providing the service. So kind of orchestrating the people who help provide the service that makes milk useful to people instead of saying, here's the milk tool, use it how you want. So I think it could be that a marketplace is a nice way to do that. But even, you know, maybe on the defensibility point, I, you know, I don't think you should make a marketplace if that's not a good idea, <laughs> you know, if that's not what customers want. Um, but I think if you are orchestrating suppliers, you know who are the good people, who's available in what form of contract situation or full-time situation, but you can orchestrate that human capital along with the tool to provide like a really unique efficient, you know, low cost, high quality experience. That's the, that's what I recall at least being most excited about. And I felt like a lot of this stuff very early on was very much like tool focused and sort of avoiding dealing with the people side of it. And I think the people side of it, if you can orchestrate, whether it's marketplace or kind of, you know, if you call it opaque or, you know, kind of in-house, let's say, but the orchestration of knowing who is good at which types of things and getting people yeah available to do those real time at a, you know, kind of high quality, low cost. I think that's, 
I, that's kind of excited I, about here. I I think that's a really good idea. It, it reminds me of like the um, the certified, you know, kind of list of directory or something of people that you could recommend. I, yeah, I, I think we'll 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 likely do something like that. Priority wise, there's I can tell you, yeah, we have to set up so many things. We're, yeah, yeah. we're just going through the uh, compliance process of getting like SOC two certified. Oh yeah, <laughs> that's like a whole thing. We have like a whole feature set that we want to release, and it, it's it it. What's interesting right now is um because there's so many video companies in 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 the video space. And mm-hmm. um, a lot of them are getting funded, you know, pretty aggressively. Um, and then some of them are like doing really, really well. Like mm-hmm. if you looked at their not like Kapwing does a hundred thousand video renders a day, which wow. is pretty, pretty insane. Um, yeah. You know, uh, the um, I don't know Reduct uh, video. They're like a text UX uh, video tool, which could see be seen as like a competitor in a sense, but we don't we don't really see it so much. Their like er- original deals were like six figure deals, hu- huge mm. huge deals, which is also uh, really crazy. So some of their um, company uh, cu- customers are like hundred seat customers at a pretty big ex- you know cost, mm-hmm. um, which is which is pretty crazy. And then you have like the Loom growth, which is like uh, it, it it's just a, <coughs> kind of uh, reflective of the industry and and the state of um, you know the tooling just insane uh insane growth rates so yeah it's just it's just interesting picking like the one thing to focus on and doing it really really well and then making sure that like knowing that there are other people doing the exact same thing figuring out how to like be defensible <laughs> it's, yeah. it's a big big question but um, I think a, a lot of defensibility in this style i think is going to come from just customer relationships right like so if you can it, yeah develop customer relationships and serve their needs well you know, it's not like they're just going to switch to something else that also does that for roughly the same price. Yeah. Yeah. There's a company that was funded um, or they announced their funding recently that does um, like your internal company, YouTube, which is basically, um, Hmm. you know, hosting, managing of video content that uh, your company has. Oh, right. To be a a source of. um, Is this the one David Ulovich from A16Z did? Yeah. No, I don't think they got A6. I think Index uh, invested in them. Okay. Oh shoot! Did A16Z really invest in them? That would be really impressive. I'm gonna I'm gonna look it up now because I thought I remember David Ulovich tweeting about uh, a thing around like system of record video for a company. Wow. Mm-hmm. Yeah, actually, that that might be the same thing. They're called Re something. <laughs> yeah, that sounds right. Rewatch. <laughs> rewatch. Yeah. Oh, I didn't Investing in Rewatch. A16Z invested in them. Yeah, there's the link. Oh wow, that's impressive. When when I saw this, I was I like, exactly. I was, you know, kind of like unsurprised that this need is being met and is underserved because we use an internal build of this experience. We're having this highlighter experience. We have an yep. internal build that we use to be kind of our system of record for all of our video content. We have it all transcribed and indexed and available for us to use. Now we've never consider really making it available to third party companies, but yeah, uh, it's, it's interesting. I, wow. I missed, I didn't realize their, um, I guess I saw one investment announcement. I missed this one, but, um, what, so what my kind of thesis here is, you, I don't know if you saw the recent iOS announcements and all the features and stuff. The, um, I haven't followed it closely. What so, was so interesting? What, what, one of the cool, um, features, which was this inevitable thing we were just waiting to see is all your photos are now uh, indexed. Um, the, the text written content is indexed mm. and searchable. So, oh, right. Okay. This is like the Google Lens competitor from Apple. Yeah. And I, yep. the expectation was this was always going to be, you know, was it, yep. whether it was an app or OS level thing. So the, the basic idea is like, there's no reason why um, computers can't index, transcribe, and make searchable all the media content on your computer, especially, yeah. um, you know, performance-wise, it's just, like, one more indexing process. So the question is, like, when when that kicks, and then, of course, there will be these services, like, you know, that do the transcription, searching, discovery type stuff, but um, my expectation is that that will always, that, that'll be important, and that'll be, like, a, a really huge business, but... 
um, it'll move more and more down, like the, just the network stack. So if if you're on a network with other people on their computers, you'll just be searching from you know their media, and you'll be able to access whatever uh, is in your Google Drive. It won't be like a unique service that specializes in that. It'll just be like norm. But um, the creation part around what, what you do with it, I think that'll always be like there's kind of like a um, in, in, there's it's the difference between like a closed system where like there's a limited number of things that you'll end up doing or kind of interactions that you'll have um, customers or your users actually have and then interactions that can have like infinite uh, you know endless uh, types of uh, touch points where you can essentially keep doing this thing forever to the extent that mm-hmm. you feel satisfied so I, I'm, I'm I'm I feel like those like and the infinite opportunities are much more um, in like a tool, creative tool type type ecosystem and how you become applicable. Like one of the things that we're looking at is like, what are the small things that are repeatable that you're able to do that expand your market share or expand your mm-hmm. customer base? And for us, the idea of like making visual templates for specific topics is a really important kind of business move. And yep. people cool. have the inputs of, you know, whether it's like a highlighter video or Zoom recording or something, what you then do with that, or if it's an all-hands meeting, a UX interview, uh, you know, a testimonial from your customer, creating templates that use the tool that we already have that then, like, yep. creates a whole suite of templates for a new use case then makes the tool applicable to that new kind of audience. That, that, that to me, feels much more um, kind of tangible um, in, in, in have, have a larger, uh, you know, uh, kind of customer base control of growing your customer base by, by creating new types of um, primitives or things that you can build or templates around. So that, that yeah, that reminds me a little bit of like, um, you know, Airtable because Airtable is this like very broad horizontal kind of database. You can put anything in it. And I think as, you know, bringing that horizontal to a customer is hard, because like customers are like, well, okay, great, it does everything, but what does it do for me? Whereas I think the templating system that they've built to help showcase, here's a use case for maybe a marketer who's trying to organize a, you know, a launch calendar or something. Here's a template for somebody who's doing video production to manage the production schedule. And I think nailing those use cases actually, I think, is what really helps people engage and understand how to get value out of Airtable. And then once you're in there, then you understand all kinds of other stuff you can do too. Yeah, hundred percent. I actually spoke with one of Airtable's early, like I think their first growth hire and uh, Howie, the founder, you know, basically was encouraged by their investors early on, like pick a vertical that you're going to own and apply Airtable to. And then if Mm -hmm. you don't do that, your product's not like it, it was early enough in the kind of CRM time that it was unintuitive to make something that didn't have like an exact audience because right. it didn't make sense. So the, the interesting thing that he, uh, this person was explaining um, was their use of templates was never something they could like attribute to specific types of user behavior or even customer like um, uh, mm-hmm. value. So the intuitive idea is you make a set of templates. So, so the, the way they started making templates was they went to uh, G2 or like Trustpilot or something. And they searched for all like the use cases of like competitors and, and different types mm. of tools. And then they would just like make all of the templates for those specific oh, use cases oh. that were like the highest rated uh, versions of, of the things that someone would use a sh- spreadsheet for. And then when they made these templates, I think they thought initially it was like a business to business kind of use case. And eventually they realized the consumer applicability was much more kind of tangible. But the um, templates they made were that, like you said, used by people, but there was no tangible connection of like, if someone opened a template, then they paid more, or if they opened a template or the number of templates they opened or how deeply they edited a template, they paid more. It was more like they would open a template, see the tool being used, and then like do something completely different. And the templates were more like educational just to see like- like, It's like onboarding. (laughs) No, exactly. So so what they realized was like templates were just the onboarding and they tried to figure out like in their onboarding what templates to show the person to figure out what would be applicable. But it was really just, they use the templates to figure out the tool's applicability to themselves. And then they use the tool in totally unrelated way, which is kind of what we're targeting to do. But I, I think the difference- with design stuff, it's like Canva's example. If you give somebody something that they think represents their aesthetic and is like 90% of the way there, 
and then you can create endless amounts of things for people to kind of discover, then the ability of showing them the relevant things will be 90% of what they use. They might change the font or, you know, change right. the, their content. But I, I think that's, um, I haven't proven that, but I, I think that's actually the way that people want to make video content. But majority of people aren't going to spend any time to, you know, edit something, but they want it to look good in some way. So, yeah. What's been your approach to figuring out like what templates are the most useful? I mean, are there pe are there things that people are already doing that you're like, okay, this is a repeated use case that we could just make way faster with a template? Or is it more kind of the Airtable, like let's look at all the possibilities that are out there and try to fit? Yeah, so so we're, we're really trying to be uh, synonymous with uh, webinars. So that's, that's just, any any kind of like within webinars, there's like specific kinds of verticals, and then we're just making templates for those specific things. So, webinar with two people talking, Q and A with like a group, uh, someone who's like talking about a product and they're presenting it, and like creating a couple visual like ways of how the person's face gets cropped or how like the title or description yeah. gets prefilled, and and that, that ends up being. Um, more complicated to do in like some kind of video editing software but if the parameters that you have to modify are limited but you're still using your own content it becomes really usable and what people are doing now is um i think i maybe mentioned this last time but uh they're taking their own video content bringing it in and then like you know they have like a couple templates they themselves have made or use and they just keep using that again and again um, yeah so it's yeah it's it, it the question is like um, what's like the next big category after that? So um, UX interviews is is kind of the obvious thing that is Just people yeah. are presenting, um, and then testimonials like customer testimonials, mm. making those look good. People pay a lot right. of money for, and then beyond that, I personally think there's like a huge huge opportunity in the live streaming kind of content, whether it's like virtual events like this type of stuff, um, or it's just like businesses, e-commerce. Like, so I think that's a whole category that hasn't really unpacked itself yet because the amount of video that's being produced in this kind of format actually is, um, it just hasn't, you know, it, it, it's so easy to do. Anyone can do it. Businesses will do it. It'll be strategic at some level. And what they do with that kind of content is, um, you know, untapped. So I, I think that's the kind of, you know, mid-stage big opportunity that we're, we're, we're bullish about, like that we think there's, there's going to be a lot of things. What templates that looks like, I actually, I don't know right now, but I, I think that's going to be like the, the step change in the amount of video content being produced and the number of minutes of video being produced that will be applicable for. So have, have you thought about, I mean, it's interesting that you have the, all these use cases um, and they, they all sound like credible and category kind of defining type things. We could find a lot of customers and if I go to milk.video today, actually, I'm just going to pull it up. Um, it says, turn your webinar into video highlights. Turn your webinar or any video recording into an engaging video highlight. It's very kind of horizontal and platform in nature. Whereas I wonder, what if you just like did, you know, milk.video slash UX interview? We, so and we are. We are. We do. Okay. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're just the, um, it, it's really interesting. We're able to, uh, um, yeah, so we have like case study, kind of a plan um, based on the webinar category. We're going to release like 50 to 100 uh, webinar related templates that have their own category, oh, cool. create case studies, um, and then, yeah, more or less create these different categories. We're, the people who will pay to make a webinar video kind of into an edited clip is like a very specific type of person, and the amount that they'll pay is dramatically more than the type of person who will pay for like a social media video. So mm -hmm. fun functionally we provide say the same thing as say coupling, but we mm -hmm. charge 10 times more for the, you know, a, a, a lesser product, a less mm -hmm. refined, less stable product because we've picked like a very specific vertical to focus on. But then the verticals that we're focusing on again, continue on like what is an enterprise, you know, large scale company do that has a mature team and, you know, their lack of resources time but they still need to have like quality that that kind of uh, specific group is what we're edging toward. If, if we wanted to, we could build like 10, you know, 20 case study use use case pages and um, have examples. And but I don't think we could handle it right now. That's the other side. 
So right. um, we we are slowly edging. It's it's been it's an interesting problem. We we um we were having plenty because videos not surprisingly very complicated. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. I guess you you've discovered this in your own approaches, but um, even just working with recorded video and yeah being able to do it effectively and you know cost effectively yeah. is it, it's 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 uh it's non non uh it doesn't your existing knowledge of making things does not really carry over you have to like figure out a whole new category of stuff so that's that's right. how it is but um have you found um i guess like we, we use a bunch of apis that help simplify a lot of that have you found sort of a lot of experimentation with different providers or do you have like a few core ones that you we we're, we do everything across? ourselves yeah we have our own video rendering thing it's all oh, wow. packaged um different different kind of tooling around that uh, mm-hmm. it, in, intentionally so because then it gives us room to be more expressive the, the only thing we use external provider for is transcripts which a great tool is assembly ai i don't know who you, who you use but uh mm-hmm. cost wise they're really really great uh speed wise they're really really great and um, quality-wise, they're, you know, I think better than a lot of the more expensive options. Oh, really? I was not even familiar with Assembly AI. Yeah. So I, I mostly um, have looked at a lot of the GCP offerings and uh, Rev.ai. Yeah, Rev's good. Um, so the, the difference, I think, is Rev just specializes in certain types of, they have really great labeled data, but the models mm-hmm. are, are not so great. And assembly AI has really differentiated themselves in like mm. just staffing great deep learning uh, kind of practices. They update their model pretty frequently. It's you know surprising uh, how how good it can be. We use GCP for non English related translations, so mm-hmm. it's good, but um, it's also not that great, and it's very slow, which sucks to build UI off of. So, but um, that's cool. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah, we use Rev for all the manual stuff and then assembly for the uh, automated stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The, I'm um, looking at, the, at assembly right now. <laughs> the, the cost for assembly versus Rev is uh, it's pretty dramatically. So they, they're quoting it as $0.00025 per audio second. <laughs> <laughs> trying to do the conversion. I th- if I recall, Rev was like oh, on an enhanced model, or TCP, I think, on an enhanced phone or video model is like two bucks. I can a dollar sixty-two an hour. I thought it back to, if I recall, I, th- I think it's like two bucks. Yeah, it, it, it's probably like two bucks and ten cents a, an hour or something like that. Okay, yeah, that sounds about right. So, like in the range of a couple bucks an hour, and this is what. How many zeros were those? I'm going to do, yeah. So that's seconds times 60 is minutes times 60 is hours. So nine ninety cents per hour, roughly. So it's kind of in the order of like half, is that? Yeah, they they do half a cent an hour. That's that their pricing, 50 cents. Half a hour. cent an hour. Oh, sorry, 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 50 cents, 50 cents. 50 cents an hour, okay. Yeah. Half, half, half a dollar. Yeah. <laughs> half, half a cent a dollar, 50 cents. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the US uh, yeah. doesn't make any sense. Um, <laughs> I think Rev, its scale is actually um, cheaper, but um, they're also like in the dollar something range uh, an hour, if I recall correctly. All right. Do you know the people behind Assembly Air? Yeah, um, they're, uh, it's, it's one guy and then a team. I think they just raised this Series A round, but um, uh, super, super responsive. Very, very, um, um, you know, helpful. We're, we have like a shared Slack and three of their team are kind of, they'll answer questions and give timelines of, uh, you know, model updates and stuff, which is r- really nice um, for somebody. Yeah, it looks like, like super, on. super well done. Yeah, like the whole the website, all the messaging, the blog posts, just looks like super pro. Can't believe we never ran into this. <laughs> now, so, so, so if you were if you were trying to um, give Assembly AI advice on how to meet us, for example, because like we didn't make well, this connection until here, like how how should Assembly AI be in the conversation? Because maybe that's informative for yeah how milks will be. 
That's interesting. Mm-hmm. They, so their customers are like, they want Loom to use them or Descript or somebody. Like they're mm-hmm. they're they're trying to be like the infrastructure of some of these larger things. Um, I don't know. I, I we found them because they have the best uh, G two rating for transcripts, and that's mm-hmm. where we're working. And then they were just extremely responsive the moment that um, I had reached out on a Sunday in the morning, you know, mm. which which is uh, always impressive. Um, yeah. yeah, jumped on a phone call and ten minutes later. I um, I think the yeah, I don't know. I don't, I don't know how you guys looked up uh, your providers, but I imagine they would pop up more and more now. Okay, we we first started investigating the transcription stuff years ago, so maybe it was just not as maybe they weren't as active in the sp- space. Are they more relatively relatively newer? I think there's like maybe three three year old company, four year old company. Oh, okay. One one thing is, I remember I, I was using GCP because I I knew that Descript used them uh, because of a blog post that uh, Andrew Mason had written, and that was like, you know, the the benchmarks that they ran. And then I knew that Rev was very popular for a while, also because mm-hmm. um, the uh, tooling, they, they had all the label data that you could want. So that was right. like an obvious reason why they would be better. And I was really impressed just how much better Assembly AI was. Um, mm-hmm. And then performance-wise, like they, it's very, very fast, which is uh, impressive. And they're willing to spin up dedicated machines just for your you know work, mm-hmm. workloads if, if you actually work with them. So. That's impressive that they could. So, you know, given just sort of the the depth of of the bench at Google, and kind of everything Google does at scale, and you know, as cheap as possible, and great deep learning people. Like, how do you? I mean, I'm, I'm impressed that Assembly AI can come to market and offer like faster, better, cheaper. It's it's like think of um, you know, do you want to buy um, you know a thing from a company that produces like a hundred thousand widgets or do you want to buy from the company that like specializes in that like single widget that like fulfills your purpose? I, I think the problem with like the Amazon Google um, kind of approach is they don't deploy updates that quickly mm-hmm. and their infrastructure was designed, I think for the first round of uh, kind of transcription. So it's more for short speech. So their API is literally, you know, horrible to use for long, long speech. Um, right. With, makes sense that they would update that at some point, but they haven't. And then on their end, their whole model kind of based the, the assembly AI, I think uh, strength is that they're implementing models that have, you know, architectures, basically like any kind of automated um, speech to or tech, text to speech uh, kind of services generally like top out at like 95% accuracy. And then after that, it's really hard to get better. Whereas like a person can at least get like 99%, you know, point, point 0.9 or whatever. Yep. The um, the differences though is not so much in the label data, but it's the architecture of the actual model. So if you apply the breakthroughs of self-driving cars or whatever kind mm-hmm. of latest, uh, mm-hmm. kind of, you know, areas research is being applied to, and then you apply that to, um, you know, uh, speech to text. Actually, you can make your model uh, accuracy significantly better, even with the same label data. So, um, kind of assembly AI's response to, you know, how can they be better than Rev, which is getting tons of speech that's, you know, labeled and whatnot? Is it, at a certain point, your models don't, uh, you know, improve unless you change the architecture, and that's what they're focused on is kind of architectural um, uh, iteration. So, it's, yeah. so they have none of the they have none of the sort of legacy architecture to support, so they can just kind of start with the the best known techniques today. That's cool. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, and in, in the kind of assumption, I, I forget um, if this time range is exactly correct, but was like within like about ten years, seven seven to ten years, the accuracy of automated systems will be you know better than people and. Mm. I mean, a human transcriber will do some Google searching, check to see if a term makes sense, right. if the context of the term is fitting with, you know, some other sentence. So, yeah, yeah impressive to think that that will be done by t- completely automated. But uh, is that is that seven to ten years? Is that your estimate? Their estimate? Somebody else? That, that was that was that was what uh, uh, Dylan from Assembly AI had said. So, huh. yeah. Cool. I and, wonder with that, you know, I think I think quality is certainly one. Um, axis of 
of kind of expectation or, or decision. I've also kind of I've, I've even drawn the graphs when we think about sort of transcription as it relates to video content around how the cost of transcription should be kind of roughly rounding to zero, like soonish, it seems. Yeah, I mean, um, it, there's, there's no reason it can't just happen on your computer right now, right? Right. And, yeah. and at a certain point, like, this is what I mean. It's, so Spotlight on Apple's computer mm-hmm. are, is the thing that you associate with indexing your files when you search for something. Yeah. Why all, all the media files on your computer being, you know, backlogged to be processed or on a phone, you know, everything being backlogged to just get transcribed is, I mean, it is it, it iOS version 15 today, probably by right. 15, that'll be like a norm. And right. at that point, if you're like looking for voice note or video file or something like right. searching by the content, searching by the transcript, that, that'll just be like a base that we expect. So. I, I right. yeah I I think it not only will it be at zero it'll be you know everywhere and then yeah. then then the question becomes like what are the UI UX you know kind of experiences that people get used to probably it'll just be search based initially but then like there will be services that it's it, it's an interesting kind of paradigm I I think um there was like an old uh, Bill Gates video that I had seen uh, where. I think him, he and he and uh, Steve Jobs are talking. It's like the last uh, um, Wall Street Journal um, uh, kind of discussion that Steve Jobs was still alive for that, that was recorded. And it's I think in the early two thousands or maybe even the nineties. I, I think it was the early two thousands. Um, but um, the kind of bullishness that uh, Bill Gates had on voice interfaces is really interesting. Yeah. Because I feel like that didn't really manifest in the way that he was so confident about. But I think that those are like the things that are now uh, kind of take, taking place in just all of the office software that we use, like all, yeah. all of the kind of tooling. Yeah, yeah, it reminds me we had Eugene Way on and he was talking about how like you, any media you create should instantly be like able to be consumed in whatever media format the consumer wants, like depending on what they're doing and what they want to use it for, et cetera. To just like make a video, but it should be audio only and text and like whatever <laughs> sliced and diced in all these different ways, just automatically, and then push it out. Yeah, yeah. I I, I have a very weird pattern of when I watch TV, if I watch like a Netflix series or something, I go captions on and then I skip every fifteen seconds. <laughs> so it's more like oh, wow. a, it's like a like reading here. Yeah, yeah. So I'll watch like a season of a show in like two hours or something. Wow, that's it's, so interesting. I've never tried that. <laughs> have you ever tried explainer mode? I, th- I think that's what they call it. There's like a audio a description. Version. Yeah, audio descriptions. Yeah, have you done that? That's, I, I I turn it on by accident sometimes. I'm I'm always impressed. They 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 must spend a lot of money to create it. I can't yeah. do that many people. Someone tells you like a man is walking into a room right now. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The scene is panning. A woman in a red dress walks into the screen. Like it's wow. <laughs> So Amazon has it on all their like uh, original pieces, and it's impressive how it's like listening to a story. It's kind of a weird. It, it's like listening to an old nineteen uh, fifties like radio yeah, show yeah. or something. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but wow. that would be another part, like to you know, to serve Eugene's use case of being able to kind right. of multiplex and demultiplex from any format to any other format. Kind of the explainer content. I mean, that that would be a super hard one. Could you imagine? the day when somebody builds an AI that is able to process video content and write explainer. Well, so, so I think it, 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 um, there's, there was a big, I'm blinking on what the name of the model was, but there was a relatively significant announcement Facebook made where th- there's like a word vector system of seeing words in relation to other words is kind of a thesaurus, like a uh, kind of search query. They apply that to, um, you know, uh, images so you can kind of take the contents of an image then look at the relationship of those words uh of dis- the described image and then mm-hmm. be able to create another um you know set of, of words to describe that and then they apply that to video in the same way so you can then describe scenes based on this way of uh finding the sentences that make the most sense based on the words that are associated to the objects it, 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 it's 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 happening which is kind of cool then yeah. Google is doing this with um, making search results where you can search for a specific point in a video 
which previously was done based on people creating timestamps, but now they're just doing it based on the transcripts and then they're doing topic based kind of, uh, you know, starting and ending, um, which is, which is cool. So if you think about 50 years ago, it was like people on radio shows describing stories and now today that's automated. Then I guess 50 years from now, we're going to have people or algorithms creating TV shows and then the kind of common archetypes of narratives being described in. That's exactly what he was saying. Yeah. That's exactly. Yeah. He was called it the storytelling singularity. He said that, like, just like you have kind of, I don't know, templates for code or whatever, you, you can have templates for stories, like feed something in, like maybe feed a spec for a couple of characters or whatever, and then spit out 50 versions of your story that can then be like piloted to different audiences and like almost like choose your own adventure style books. Did, did, you, did you see the... Um the YouTube uh, kind of fiasco of people who are creating auto-generated children's content of their, no, oh, they were creating like very sexually, um, you know, uh, violent, oh. kind of funky auto-generated 3D content that was uh, getting recommended in uh, children um, oh, kind yeah. of YouTube uh, algorithm circles. And um, wow. it, yeah, it was, it was basically auto automatically creating content and then getting recommended in it was creating huge amount of ad revenue for uh the people who are creating this stuff um i'll find a link and share it but uh, oh wow so just like random independent creators auto generating the stuff and putting it on youtube i don't think it was random people i think it was people who knew how to game the ad yeah. network on youtube and then they knew what kind of content was getting watched uh interesting wow yeah there was some very funky stuff. Um, they were I, like, I still. Go ahead. No, 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 no. Yeah, go, sorry. I was just say it, it reminds me a little bit of like early on. You know, I'm sure there's still plenty of this today, but like as the web didn't have all of its content, you know, there wasn't kind of a content matching every query. It would become these like kind of low cost, kind of bot farm, kind of you know human assisted bot farms that would try to create content that would serve you know, queries that were getting generated, but that were underserved on the web. Mm. And so these were, they call them like content farms. And um, that concept is like relatively easy and cheap to do in text. And so the web has gotten filled up. So any query basically has some landing page, you know, even if it's fairly low quality. Um, And, you know, obviously Google wants to get people to the best quality pages and wants better quality pages to be made. But then you sort of look at the world of video and it's just like a whole other ecosystem because there's such a gap between people's demand for video content and interest in consuming via video, but then actually like creating content in any kind of content farm okay. or bot related way is just super hard and it's expensive. It looks kind of too crappy or obviously not high quality. So I think there's actually, you know, video represents the largest arbitrage between people's demand for consumption format and people's ability to produce in the format. Mm. That's, that's interesting. That, yeah, that's very interesting. So that it's it's kind of like one. There's the ability to do this, but so so there's kind of a there's a price on whoever does it best and then continues to do it well. The um, yeah, it's like a reward for figuring out that problem. I, I wonder what so on the kind of kind of depressing angle. There's the uh, just ad network version of this. But I wonder what like the educational version of this is like if, if you're mm-hmm. able to teach to someone's like ability and then yeah. you're able to kind of uh, in, in some way understand what, you know, someone doesn't know and what they do know and, and how you are able to facilitate the most like, kind of uh, um, uh, absorbable way of information transfer that, that, that kind of stuff, then it's the same, yeah. same kind of technology, but uh, yeah. value oriented around it as opposed to, but I, it's it's interesting um, the the kind of future the um, the minority report report future of like customized ads and stuff is inevitable so that that is depressingly real uh, yeah I, I I don't know so it's like I, you know I, I agree it feels like we're going there but I also think there's an argument to be made and we're already seeing some of these things play out which you know, I mean, a friend of mine actually proposed this idea that, you know, he, he posed it to me like 10 years ago and sounded so bizarre. He said, what if advertising became regulated and became illegal? I, 
I, I think advertised uh, services are really important. They, they make ex- accessibility of otherwise expensive. They, they make it possible for someone who can't afford access to certain things, um, you know, get, get access to it. And I, I, I imagine, yeah, b- bad advertising uh, or, or like the, the kind of clear scam based advertising is, is right. should definitely be regulated. But it may, I mean, what the Facebook, it, there's, there was a good article, I think by Tim, uh, Berners Lee, maybe, or some, mm. somebody who wrote um, "Data is not the new oil." Did you see this mm. article? I've, I've I've seen that quote where somebody was coming back on the uh, kind of common claim that data is the new oil. Yeah, yeah. It, his his answer was um, "Data is the new silicon," or "Data is the new sand." Like it's only valuable when it's refined through a highly uh, processed you know, machine and in being mm-hmm. processed, it then actually becomes useful for everybody, but in its raw form actually is useless. And like, it, I, I think people have quantified what the value of one Facebook advertisement throughout a year, like the impressions over a year are for an individual. And it's like cents on a dollar, maybe like a few single dollars, like $3 or something. You're saying but, for a given advertisement. Yeah. Like Facebook's value of a user, um, how, how they value an, and then, oh, the, the average revenue per user? I think it's like $100 or something. Not the average revenue per US user. user. Um, but the, oh, yeah, maybe, okay, so that's interesting. That's a, the typical way to look at it is like if the average revenue per user sometimes broken down by like, like uh, you know, uh, country because there's like GDP and kind of, uh, you know, economic differences. But if I recall, ARPU for a US user on Facebook, at least in recent years, I think has probably crossed a hundred dollars, which I think you know oh, Google crossed a long time ago. Wow, could okay. be. Yeah, I think the issue is like the idea of direct paying people the value that they have in the ad ecosystem is tricky. Like because each ad is fairly low value, like on the order of like you know fractions of a cent, and there's just like you know thousands of ads consumed by the that average user per year. Um, I wonder what the me- metric was, but the subsidy of so, so the article I was pointing out was from Tim O'Reilly in fe- February. Mm, um, right. But uh, the um, the I think Tyler Cowen does some kind of math where basically like the cost to have access to all these things, um, you know, whether it's communication tools or mm-hmm. uh, being able to be in touch with people, uh, information that you pay, the entertainment yep. that you pay for, like, th- those things are far outweighed. Um, the value that you get far outweighs the kind of cost that uh, it has on you. So th- the aver- kind of advertised, subsidized, advertising subsidized internet, I have yet to be convinced that it's a totally bad thing. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I wouldn't say I'm convinced either way that it's good or bad, but I do think that the direct pay internet is deeply underexplored. Yeah. Because it- like when most of the large platforms were created, it was nearly impossible to collect payments and it was a very uncomfortable thing for people to do. So I think, you know, I'm excited about a future. I think, sure, ads, they're fine. These are businesses. I don't predict they become regulated out of existence anytime soon. That was more just like a a bizarre thought experiment. (laughs) But I think the thing that I'm more excited about is that there, there are people willing to pay for content. It doesn't have to be everybody, but if you can help serve people's needs and desires to pay for content, that payment and the communications and sharing around that could actually subsidize people who don't want to pay for content. So I think you can get like a similar subsidy, but instead of advertising like teeth whiteners, you're sort of like providing a conduit to pay for content that some people want to pay for and that that becomes the subsidy. Yeah. It's, I mean, that's, you're just describing like, the kind of Substack, OnlyFans kind of progression. It it it, it it's interesting. Yeah, some of that. The, those, those we haven't really seen that work in a really broad networked way yet, because like Substack yeah. is not a super networked tool. Like it's a very like utility tool, yeah. which is great. But I think how you actually cross promote to other audiences and help give people serendipitous discovery of interesting new things, I think, is a tougher thing given the relationships that they have with their creators. Um, you know, not, not suggesting they can't get there, but just like it's, it's a 
bit of an evolution I, from where they are right now. Yeah, I, I think what's what what's likely to happen first is kind of what's happening with Substack, where like the creators who are able to command a certain kind of community will create their own version of like creator network so they're do profit sharing and then probably mm -hmm. we'll go the other side which is the consumers will then group and that you kind of see that with like um these like buyer um uh, shareable credit cards and stuff which is also interesting people creating their own groups of like consumption mm -hmm. they're subscribing for things as a group that oh, that's the the thing that where, I, where do we see those i'm, I'm not as familiar with that yeah. if you look at like college students who are sharing cost subscription to netflix or something or oh people i see people who are like getting newspaper together the uh -huh. um the thing that's interesting my so my wife is writing a book she just got an agent for this which is a really big deal on the consequences of everyone being like a news publisher in mm -hmm. in like an algorithmic world and i i think it's so tricky right like my mom is an anti-vaxxer which is very interesting because there's enough information that fulfills her like category of areas mm -hmm. that justifies a way of thinking and mm -hmm. if you look at like the trump world of like pe the farces that many people may have believed in that not not politically in any way but like things that were clearly wrong it's like possible to create that that world of that kind of uh, the information economy of you know making money off of believing something because the means are there so I, I don't think the kind of microtransaction world is bad but it is interesting to think like what are the ethics or morals or like the things that is a society we haven't really mastered yet that mm -hmm. speaking of regulation that like become wrong to uh you know uh continue if or to right. participate in that that is an interesting thing that over the next you know what what's taught in elementary school in a world where like everyone has a tiktok account or what what is the kind of the rules and kind of you know the the um clay shirky's uh you know his whole thing about comments on youtube like everyone's an asshole in comment but if you talk mm -hmm. to them like that 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 that, that is our world today <laughs> you right. know, so what, what are the ethics and kind of lessons that you have to teach to people oh, that's interesting yeah like do you have the median views of corporations sort of being like distributed to everyone via an ad model like what are the trade-offs between that versus more nuanced views for different subcultures that people are individually like choosing and paying for Maybe in some cases, like the median view is like safer or less. Yeah, and, and it's it's not good, right? The the negative part of having a centralized editorial system is that it's manipulatable, or the messages that they share are, you know, pro promoted by the people who own those networks. And the opposite is good. You have decentralized. Yeah. It's just it's the yeah, yeah, exactly. And and I think it's society matures, and w these are problems we've already kind of experienced when mediums change. But it, it's like. There is an interesting question of like, what are the lessons kids should be learning today? And privacy is one of them. Knowing like mm -hmm. the repercussions of what you produce, having yeah. intention of making money off of lies, facilitating yeah. additional false, you know, like those those things. I, it, when 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 I was growing up, it was like you can't believe what's on Wikipedia. Today, it's like actually Wikipedia is probably the greatest. <laughs> <laughs> now, like, what, that, yeah. what, what's the version of that? You know, for um, TikTok yeah. might be the best way to learn things today. Like that, that's that's something that you wouldn't have expected. Anyway, yeah, um, cool. super interesting. It's been so fun. Yeah. yeah, I think we could go on for more <laughs> hours. So we'll As have you back and we'll do this more later. Thanks for sharing, Larry. Take care.